Thank you to everybody for attending our section lecture in our series. Um, today, it's going to be given by Elise Staley, who's a, another biostatistician in our um, Cancer Center in Biostatistics and Bioinformatics Shared Resource Group. Um, and she's going to be talking about the Boeing design today. So thanks, Elise. Thanks, Andrew. So last week, my colleague Andrew talked, gave an overview of different phase one clinical trial designs. And today I'm going to be focusing on the Bayesian Optimal Interval Design, which is abbreviated as BOIN. And it is one of the phase one clinical trial designs that our core highly recommends. Today, I'll first give a brief overview of the Boyne design and how it compares with the 3 plus 3 design. I will then talk about it, how it's implemented, including the inputs that we as biostatisticians need from physicians, how the design works, and the outputs, how it is implemented. I will then go through a brief example cover a couple extensions of the Boyne design and go over a brief summary. As a reminder, the goal of phase one clinical trials is to find the MTD or maximum tolerated dose. This is defined as the dose with the DLT or dose limiting toxicity probability that is closest to the target DLT rate. As Andrew discussed last week, there are three primary types of phase one clinical trial designs. The rule-based model includes the three plus three design. And this is nice because it's simple and transparent to implement. For example, the decision rules for when to escalate and de-escalate are predetermined and can be inspected by physicians. However, this comes at the cost of being very inflexible and having poor performance. So the next type of design to be developed is the model-based design. And this includes methods, including the continual reassessment method. While model-based designs are really well-performing, they are both statistically and computationally complex. So it's met with a lot of resistance from physicians due to this closed box type approach. Finally, we have the model-assisted designs, including the design I'll be talking about today, the Boyne design. And model-assisted designs take the advantages of both the rule-based and model-based designs while eliminating many of the shortcomings of those two earlier design types. So the Boyne design is both as well-performing as the model-based design and as transparent parent to implement as the rule-based design. As you'll see, the Boyne design is actually implemented in a very similar fashion to the 3 plus 3 design. The Boyne design is also flexible, allowing for custom target toxicity rates and custom cohort sizes. First, the Boyne is much more flexible than the 3 plus 3 design. So the 3 plus 3 design fixes the DLT or dose limiting toxicity rate at 30%. The Boyne design, however, allows for this DLT rate to be customized by the user. This is important in cancer, for example, when there are subpopulations that don't yet have an effective treatment. In that case, physicians may feel that a DLT rate that is greater than 30% may actually be desirable. Additionally, the three plus three design sets the cohort size to three, while the Boyne allows this to be altered. This can make sense at the design phase. For example, a investigator may be interested in a titration approach where you start with a cohort size of one and adaptively increase the cohort size to three. Additionally, there are many circumstances where you may plan to have three participants per cohort, but perhaps a participant is no longer available or you get an extra participant enrolled. And in which case the Boyne design 
allows deviations during the trial so that information from all participants can still be used. Moin is also superior than three plus three in terms of performance. For example, in the three plus three design, the maximum tolerated dose is determined by increasing cohorts, cohorts that increase in toxicity. Once the highest dose reaches at least two DLTs, the dose one lower than that is deemed to be the MTD. This means that as soon as you have two out of three participants in one cohort with a dose limiting toxicity, the trial is stopped. However, the Boeing design pulls information across all cohorts so that information from all participants can be used to make a more informed decision. The strict stopping rule of the three plus three design also results in really small and random sample sizes. The way the three plus three design works is you can have up to only six patients who receive any given dose. And in many cases, this is simply not enough information. For example, say only one out of six participants experience a dose limiting toxicity. That's a pretty low DLT rate. However, you look around at the confidence interval around this due to such, to its such small sample size, you can see that the true toxicity rate can actually be as high as 64.1%. Conversely, with a high observed DLT rate of 50%, the true toxicity rate could be as low as only 11.8%. The Boeing design uses a more appropriate sample size that doesn't require this type of post hoc expansion going from a cohort of three to six. Additionally, the three plus three design is considered overly conservative. At first, that sounds like it could be a good thing. However, poor precision to identify the maximum tolerated dose is a problem both in terms of overly toxic and subtherapeutic doses. If a drug moves on from phase one to phase two, there's a potential for a lot of patients to be treated at the MTD identified in phase one. And if this is a subtherapeutic dose, that's quite problematic because it could overlook a drug that could be beneficial at a higher dose, and it's also a waste of resources. On the other hand, Boyne does a nice job of balancing safety for the risk of overdosing and identifying the maximum tolerated dose. So the Boyne design works by comparing the observed dose limiting toxicity rate with a pair of fixed and predetermined dose escalation and de-escalation boundaries. This is shown here in the top right. A brain trial starts at the lowest dose. And that cohort is evaluated for dose limiting toxicity. If the cohort has a dose limiting toxicity rate that is less than this escalation boundary, the next cohort receives the next higher dose. If the dose limiting toxicity is in the bounds, then the same dose is used for the next cohort of participants. And similarly, if the DLT rate is above this de-escalation bound, the next dose is lower for the next cohort of participants. This process is repeated until the maximum sample size is obtained or if the trial has to be terminated due to excessive toxicity. Now that you understand the overview of how the Boeing design works, I'm going to go through the details of its implementation. First, us as biostatisticians need information from the investigators. We need to know what's the maximum number of participants that you expect to be able to enroll, and what is your desired cohort size? Are you gonna stick with a cohort size of three, 
or do you have reason to believe a different cohort size would be beneficial? Additionally, we need to know whether you have any specific prior knowledge about safety. I'll go into later in this lecture that the Boeing design has many built-in safety rules that are sufficient in the vast majority of cases. But if there is a drug where you're abnormally concerned about safety, we are able to implement stricter stopping rules. Conversely, if there's very strong evidence that the first dose is safe, we can stop the trial early if we converge to a certain dose quickly. Finally, we need to know what the target dose limiting toxicity is, or C. And this is often set at 0 0.3. Additionally, we need to know whether the acceptable DLT rate is okay as well. So you have the target DLT, but due to small sample sizes, the true DLT is going to perhaps be a bit higher or a bit lower than that. And so we need to know what's the highest DLT rate that you would consider to be underdosing? In other words, when do we need to escalate the dose? As well as the DLT rate that would be deemed overdosing. When do we need to start de-escalating? The CT, so again, we'll need... Um, so from, usually these bounds are calculated by multiplying our target DLT rate by fixed constants. C1 is generally multiplied by 0.6. So 0 0.3 times 0 0.6 is 0.18, which would mean we would need to escalate the dose if our true toxicity rate was below 0 0.18. 0 0.42 is similarly calculated by multiplying by 1.4. And that would mean when we would need to start de-escalating the dose. We need to make sure that these bounds are acceptable. Generally, this DLT constant, so 0.6 and 1.4, is highly recommended. In certain cases, we can narrow this slightly. For example, multiplying by 1.2 to get a more conservative study. However, we have to be really careful about that because if you make the bounds too narrow, we don't have enough power to distinguish between when to escalate, de-escalate, or stay at the same dose. So in most cases, what we would recommend is if this 0.42 is too high for you, then we can actually alter the DLT rate itself, perhaps bringing it down to 0.25, which will also bring down C1 and C2. Now that we have sample size information, safety information, and the target DLT, we now need to find the escalation and de-escalation boundaries. And so the idea behind this is we want to minimize the incorrect decisions of dose escalation and de-escalation. And so we plug in this information, our target DLT and our boundaries into these formulas and get the optimal escalation and de-escalation boundaries. So continuing with these numbers, that would mean if at a given dose, less than 0.23 or 23.6% of participants have observed the DLT, then we will escalate the next cohort. If we're above the 0.359 DLT rate, then the next cohort will be de-escalated. And if we're within these bounds, the next cohort will continue at the same dose. Additionally, there are internal safety constraints. The idea behind this is if a dose is just too toxic, then we need to eliminate it from the trial altogether. This is determined with two criteria. First, we calculate the probability that the observed DLT is greater than the target DLT. If that probability is greater than 0.95, and if at least three patients were already treated at the current dose or a higher dose, 
then the current dose and all higher doses are eliminated from the trial. In the case where the lowest dose is eliminated, the, the entire trial is terminated due to excessive toxicity. Now it's time to implement the trial that we designed. It follows this general flow diagram. We start the first cohort at the lowest dose level. Then we ask, have we reached the maximum sample size? Of course, if it's our first cohort, the answer is no. And we then compute the observed dose limiting toxicity rate at the current dose. As a reminder, the DLT rate is the total number of patients who have experienced the DLT at the current dose, divided by the total number of evaluable patients treated at the current dose. It's important to note here that we're looking at patients who have been treated at that dose at any point during the study. It doesn't matter what cohort they were in. And that's a key difference from the three plus three design. So if 12 participants have been a valuable, we will see out of 12 how many have experienced the DLT when making this decision. If that rate is within our escalation and de-escalation bounds, the next cohort will be treated at the current dose and we will start this entire flow diagram over again. Likewise, if we're below the bound, we'll escalate for the next cohort and above the bound, we'll de-escalate for the next cohort. We'll repeat this entire process until either the maximum sample size is reached or the trial is terminated due to safety reasons. This table is also provided to help us calculate whether the number of DLTs is within that escalation or de-escalation boundary. So on the top row, we have the number of participants treated at the current dose. And here we have the number of DLTs that need to be experienced in order for three different actions, escalation, de-escalation, or eliminating the dose due to safety. You will see these NAs here, and that is simply because if you've only treated one or two patients, we don't have enough information yet to eliminate the dose. The table seems straightforward to begin with, but there's sometimes it's not entirely clear, and so there's a set of rules to help determine how to use this table. Eliminate, as I talked about before, means removing both the current dose and all higher doses. If a dose is eliminated, the next cohort is treated at the next lower level. Unless, of course, it's the lowest dose that was eliminated, and in which case the trial needs to stop. If no action is indicated on the table, that means the next cohort is treated at the current dose. If the current dose is the lowest dose in your trial and the rule indicates de-escalation, the next cohort should still be treated at the lowest dose, unless, of course, we have enough DLTs to eliminate the dose. Conversely, if you're being treated at the highest dose and the rule indicates escalation, then the next cohort of participants will also be treated at that highest dose level. At this point, we have now ran through the entire trial, and it is time to select the maximum tolerated dose. This process is entirely separate from the escalation and de-escalation rules. And so the idea behind this is to use a non-parametric regression technique called isotonic regression to estimate the toxicity probabilities of each dose level and I will spare you the mathematical proof of how that works behind the scenes. Then we'll choose the estimate that is closest to the target DLT rate. In the cases where there are ties, then the MTD is selected as the highest dose that is still less than the target DLT rate. This is a bit clearer looking at it visually. 
So here's an example where the target DLT rate was 0.3 and there were five dose levels. We find that after running the trial, the estimate of the DLT at different dose levels. So you'll see at dose level three, we estimate that the DLT rate is at 0 0.27, which is quite, quite close to our target of 0 0.3. We also have a confidence interval around this DLT estimate and the probability that the true toxicity is greater than our target. So at dose three, that's about a third of the time. We'll see at dose five that in this example, the trial never got to dose five, and so we don't have information on it. On the right, we can see dose one and two have really low estimated DLT rates, whereas dose three is very close to our target 0 0.3, which is in red, and the confidence interval, as you would expect, would go a bit above and below this target whereas dose four seems to be overdosing. You have a DLT that seems to be higher than what we want. So that's everything we need to know about the Boyne single agent design. But since that's a lot of information, I'll just go through a brief example from start to finish. Let's say we have a new cancer drug that is designed for a subpopulation that doesn't yet have an effective treatment. So the physician designing the trial says a target DLT rate of 0 0.35 is acceptable. We'll then calculate the toxicity bounds and make sure that those are okay too. And once we get the go ahead from the physician that 0 0.49 would still be an acceptable toxicity, even if we're aiming for lower than that, then we can proceed. In this example, say we only have 18 participants available to keep the example brief and a target cohort of three is acceptable. We'll be looking at three doses, dose one, two, and three. First, we will need to calculate the escalation and de-escalation boundary using the formula presented before we end up with our escalation bound at 0.28 and our de-escalation bound at 0.42. As with the vast majority of cases, we will also use default safety rules. Again, we'll follow this same flow chart. And as you will see, the bounds are a bit higher than before since our target DLT rate is at 0.35 instead of 0.3. On top is a table telling us when to escalate and de-escalate. So let's run a mock trial through the three doses. We'll start with our lowest dose and enroll a cohort size of three, and we observe no DLTs. Since this is the first dose, the total number treated at this dose is also three, and the total number of DLTs is also zero. So we'll go to our table, look at three patients treated, zero have experienced the DLT, and that means we need to escalate. So we'll enroll our next cohort at dose two, again with a cohort size of three. And let's say one participant had a DLT, this is our first time at dose two, so we just carry these numbers over. And we go to three and look for one. So one isn't on our table because it's above this escalation number and below this de-escalation number of two. And so the next cohort of patients will again be treated at dose level two. Let's say we have three cohort size, no DLTs. We now need to look at both of the dose two cohorts together. So six were treated, one DLT total. Again, six and one shows us to escalate. At level three, we experience two DLTs. And that means we need to de-escalate. So we're going to de-escalate back to dose two and let's say 
we have a cohort size yet again of three, and we experienced two DLTs. So that we now have nine patients treated at the dose two, three of which experienced DLTs, and that means we need to retain the dose. Finally, we get to our very last cohort, and unfortunately, one participant is no longer able to participate. And so that means we only have a cohort size of two. But that's no problem. The Boyne design can incorporate this. And we observe one out of two of these participants with a DLT. We have now reached the number of participants we have. And so it is now time to determine the MTD. As a reminder, these are the number of patients treated at each dose and the number of patients who experience DLT at each dose. This time, dose level two was selected, and you can see that the posterior DLT estimate is 0.36, so that's very close to our target of 0.35. We have a confidence interval around it. In this case, due to the small sample size, we do expect about half the time to have the true toxicity above 0.35, which makes sense if you look at our confidence interval. So at this point, I have gone through everything we need to know about a single agent blind trial. However, there are some cases when we have to consider more complex situations. For example, you might be dealing with late onset toxicities. So that means that you have to wait a while to see whether the patients enrolled to the drug are going to experience a toxicity. And this is difficult because you have patients that are waiting to be enrolled who could really benefit from the treatment, but you're not sure um, how to dose them because you don't know whether the previous cohort experienced toxicities yet. And so there's an extension of the blind design that uses real-time dose assignment for new patients while the toxicity data is pending for the patients enrolled. Additionally, there's combination trials that try to find the best combination of two different drugs when each of the drugs have multiple doses. There's also a base extension for a phase one, two combination design. This design simultaneously evaluates toxicity and efficacy in one trial. So in the typical framework, phase one would identify the dose with the appropriate toxicity, so our MTD. And then more patients will be treated at the MTD in dose two to determine whether that dose is effective. However, this assumes monotonicity, which means that as a drug's toxicity increases, so does its efficacy. But in cases where that's not true, phase one and two is able to simultaneously evaluate these aspects to get a more optimal dose. My colleague Deshaun will be talking about delayed toxicities in the fifth lecture of this series. And the phase one, two trials, while very interesting, are a little bit beyond the scope of this lecture. So I'm going to delve into the combination drug extension of the Boyne design. So as cancer treatments have improved and developed, many researchers are interested in seeing the efficacy of the combination of multiple drugs. Often this occurs when two drugs are FDA approved, but the interactions of those drugs haven't yet been thoroughly studied. This makes for some statistical challenges. So let's say we're interested in two drugs. We have drug A that is three doses, A1, A2, and A3, and drug B that has four doses we're interested in studying, B1 through B4. We know to start the trial at the lowest dose in the blind framework. So that would be A1, B1. 
But the issue is A1B1 has more than one neighbor. So what should we escalate to next? Perhaps A1B2? What about A2B1? This also brings up questions about different combinations resulting in different toxicities, since we don't know the interaction. So for example, could A1B4 have a lower DLT rate than A2B2, for example? To answer these questions, we have to solve an optimization problem. In a simple context, this can be thought of with indifference curves, which you may recognize if you've ever taken an introductory microeconomics class. So on the x-axis, we have one of my favorite Halloween candies, Reese's, and on the y-axis, we have Kit Kats. And so this Halloween, I would love a combination of both Reese's and Kit Kats. And while I want a little bit of each, I am indifferent to exactly how many of each I get with on this curve. So for example, I would be equally satisfied with a seven Kit Kats and one Reese's on point A, or with five Reese's and two Kit Kats. I would get even more enjoyment or utility in the econ framework if I got seven Kit Kats and three Reese's, or point D, three Kit Kats and five Reese's. The point here is that anywhere on a given blue line, I am indifferent. I am equally satisfied. And as I go farther away from the origin of the plot, I become more satisfied as I jump onto farther curves. Bringing this back to the more serious topic at hand, the MTD contour is a very similar concept. So the idea is to identify the contour or combination of drug A and drug B with the DLT rate closest to the target. So on each contour, we have a observed DLT rate. And so, for example, here we have 0 0.4. That means I could get this DLT rate if I had a lot of drug B and a low dose of drug A, some intermediate combination of the two, or a very high dose of drug A and a dose of drug B. And the idea is to first find this contour, and then later phases can look with on the contour to determine what the most effective combinations of the two drugs are. This can be accomplished using the Boyne waterfall design. This divides the overall optimization problem into subtrials, where each subtrial follows the same procedure that we covered in the single agent part of this lecture, so the dose escalation and de escalation procedure. Then each subtrial finds an MTD that we will call a candidate MTD. And after we've completed each subtrial, we can get an MTD contour that is comprised of all candidate MTDs. Later trials can then see of all of these contour points that have the same toxicity, which of those is most effective. This is an overview of the, what the waterfall design looks like. So we have different drug A doses and drug B doses that are broken into subtrials in order to find the contour. Let's start with subtrial A. We will start with the lowest dose, A1, B1, and perform the dose escalation and de-escalation procedure to see what our MTD for this first subtrial should be. For the first subtrial, we escalate on one drug first, so A in this case, while keeping B at the lowest dose. So A1B1, A2B1, and A3B1. We then can start escalating B if the Boeing procedure keeps telling us to escalate the dose, 
So that would be at A3, B2, A3, B3, etc. Let's say that in this case, we determine that A3, B2 was the MTD for this subtrial, and therefore it is our first MTD candidate. We are now ready to start subtrial B. And we determine our starting dose for subtrial B based on the candidate MTD from subtrial A. So before we had a dose three for A, we're gonna subtract that by one, and we're gonna add one to B. What that means is we'll start with A2, B3. At this time, we can either escalate or de-escalate. We can either de-escalate to A2, B2, or escalate to A2, B4. And you'll notice we don't have this drug here, so that would be A2, B1, because it was already looked at in subtrial A. Let's say in this case, we ended up choosing A2, B3 as our MTD candidate. We will now go to our third and last subtrial, starting at one minus our A dose from last time and one plus our B dose from last time to get A1, B4. We'd again perform the Boyne procedure. This time we are starting here. And so we can't actually escalate because this is our highest dose for this subtrial. And so if we need to de-escalate, we can do so down to A1, B3 and A1, B2. In this case, let's say we've determined that A1, B4 is the MTD candidate for this trial. We can now put it all together and we see that we have A3, B2, a2, B3, and A1, B4 as all three of our candidate MTDs. And now as we move on to phase two, we can evaluate which of these dose combinations are most effective since we are considering them to be approximately equivalently toxic. summary, the model-assisted Boyne design is both highly transparent and highly effective. It takes the advantages from both the model-based and rule-based designs while mitigating the shortcomings of those two earlier designs. Its flexibility is also really helpful, having a flexible target DLT and cohort size. And Boyne has a wide variety of extensions that allow for more complex designs for certain situations. And the key takeaway of this is that the phase one trial design of Boyne is one that our center, cancer center really recommends due to its performance and simplicity. And speaking of which, if you have any trials that you need help designing or Analyzing our cancer center can certainly do that. I've also included some select references should you be interested in uh, reading more about this topic. And additionally, this talk will be posted on our cancer center YouTube page. With that, I conclude this second lecture. And so if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you. All right, well, if there are no questions, we can wrap up and I hope many of you will be able to come to our lecture next week that Andrew will be giving. Awesome. Thank you very much, Elise, and uh, thank you for everybody who joined us today. Like Elise said, um, there'll be another lecture next week, uh, same time, uh, and this time it'll be covering 